All right, we're almost all back. I, need a, I have a couple of administrative voting matters that I'm gonna need um, at least Assembly member Lee back for Senator Skinner and Judge Henderson too. Okay, great. I'm right here. <laughs> Good, no worries. Um, let us um, just get to a few administrative matters. First, we need to approve the minutes from our September 30 meeting. Uh, will someone please, uh, so I move to, to approve those minutes. Will somebody second that, please? Second. Does anybody oppose? All right, so the minutes from our September 30 meeting are approved. Uh, the next administrative matter that I wanted to mention to everybody on the committee, but also in the public, is that the committee is currently hiring a senior staff attorney. Thank you to the legislature for approving that position. If anyone is interested in applying or knows any good candidates, please be in touch with Tom, whose email is in the committee website. Uh, and next year, we also anticipating hiring a sec another attorney and uh, we'll let everyone know as that process begins, but uh, please stay tuned with our website uh, for those updates. All right, um, we are getting to really the important piece of the meeting in terms of the committee members. So I do hope that Senator Skinner and Professor Ochin and Judge Henderson can join us. I'll give a couple more minutes because we really, this is, in, this is, in, this is the meat of the matter. <laughs> so Peter, how many more days at uh, your department diversion? Can't hear you. Can't hear you. Six days and four hours, Carlos. <laughs> and then he came us. Who knows? Take some time off. Nothing. Yeah, I'm going to take some time off. I'm going up to Oregon to see one of my kids. And oh, yeah, yeah. Nothing, nothing planned. Um, I'm, you know, I've got a couple of board obligations, but yeah, of course, um, I yeah. hope to continue this work. But um, okay, uh, sorry to interrupt. Um, and, and we're going to, you know, we're not going to let Judge uh, Espinoza go too, too far because, uh, we need him. Um, so uh, again, I would love to proceed with um, with the full complement of our members because uh, this is when we're going to make final our final recommendations or at least um, discuss them, see if there are any edits, comments, suggestions to the report. Um, we're going to follow our usual process. We'll first discuss the report and any potential changes among members, if there are any questions for staff about the substance of the report, where they're gonna hear from public comment. After public comment, the committee members will address any last minute concerns raised by the public or issues, and then vote on whether to adopt the report with any noted changes. The report is an elaboration of the recommendations we discussed in September, supported by empirical analysis, review of similar reforms in other states and other original research conducted with our help with our partners at the California Policy Lab. Good to see Judge Henderson. Um, we are still finalizing some data and this draft and the report will be put into a final form by our graphic designer and proofread and done other non-substantive changes. Um, the goal today is to see if there are any substantive changes that the committee wants to make with the understanding that I, will that I will have the final discretion over copy editing, adding citation, updating the data and other non-substantive issues. Unlike our previous reports from this year, staff prepared one recommendation that the committee has not yet made up its own mind up yet. 
And that is recommendation number six, which is whether or not to allow appellate courts to reduce sentences in the interest of justice. We discussed this issue at some length. I know that there were concerns raised about it and we agreed to think about it some more. Today, we'll finally decide whether or not this item becomes part of our final report and recommendations. Given this, I intend for our discussion to have two parts. First, I would like to see if there are any questions about the report in general, and then leave for the end of our discussion, the recommendation on number six, and whether or not the committee will include this as part of a report. So let's do the first part first, if everybody's ready. Does anyone have any questions, comments, concerns about the report or any of the recommendations on a substantive level, again, aside from number six, that you'd like to discuss further as a group? Yeah, uh, I, I don't, but maybe you could just go through the items. One, just to refresh my- Sure, Tom, Tom, can you come up and go through the items? Absolutely. So the first, you know, there's sort of the introductory uh, material, which goes over a, a few things, including, uh, you know, the report we had on crime uh, rates during the pandemic and um, racial disparities in incarceration rates and uh, some updates on research onto incarceration. Then we get to the recommendations. So I don't know if anybody had anything on the uh, that introductory material. Okay. And then the first of the recommendations is about strengthening the mental health diversion law, uh, about changing some uh, existing statute, statute there that uh, create, was created in 2018. Second recommendation. Uh, well, no, no issue on that. Okay. Right? You know, I mean, is that what you want, Michael? You know? like... Sorry, I don't think that we need to weigh in. On, we voted to recommend to approve all these. So I don't think that there needs to be any further assent but right, if you okay. have questions or concerns, this is your, you know, this is your time. Right. Okay. All right. So Tom, you just want to go through them quickly. Yep. And then after uh, the mental health diversion was uh, encouraging alternatives to incarceration by creating a statement in the penal code that um, the least restrictive means should be used when disposing of, of cases. Next is expanding CDCR's existing reentry program. These are the MCRP, CCTRP. So expanding those so more people are able to take advantage of that. Number four is um, about parole eligibility for people in prison, about uh, taking what is essentially the existing Prop 57 process, expanding that to everyone who isn't currently eligible. Um, right now, Prop 57 just covers nonviolent offenses. Hey, sorry, can we go back to the reentry one? Yes. Apologies, but, and apologies if I, um, I didn't jump ahead to look at the others, but the, the reentry one is, <clears throat> for once a person has been released, weren't we also discussing um, a, uh, and maybe it's further up in the, the um, recommendations, but a uh, uh, last year or last two years of right. um, yeah. sentence, uh, is that later in the recommendations? No, that, that, that's what this that's what this recommendation is. It's a set. OK, her, her, but this recommendation says all people. Oh, eventually. OK, sorry. Eventually all people. So just See, to, because how I read it was that it really refers only to people after release versus in that potentially additionally last year or last two years of sentence. Correct. And, and, and we can clarify that. Yeah. Um, but let's just make sure that we all understand here. There's currently exists a program. The men's program is called the Male Community Reentry Program. There's another, there's women's program, CCTRP, which another acronym, but essentially it is the legislature recently expanded it. So for a small group of people um, to have their last two years of incarceration in one of these, uh, for lack of a better term, halfway house or residential reentry programs, uh, to spend their time in those programs in the community they're working but they are uh, monitored and um, by uh, law enforcement and to but that be, for a number of reasons it's limited to about 12 to 1500 beds people at a time right now and um, reports that we've seen have showed it being incredibly successful in terms of um, reducing recidivism and the recommendation is to expand that so that everybody leaving prison has some opportunity to go through these residential reentry programs. That is the way that it works in the federal system. We appreciate that it's a big lift because 
Right now, about 30,000 plus people are released from prison in California every year. And like I said, we only have about 12 to 1500 beds. So it'd be an, a major expansion. Um, but that's the recommendation in a nutshell. Well, I think we should just clarify that opening part a little. Mm -hmm. Got no problem. Uh, okay, and then we talked about the parole eligibility equalizing that, um, starting with the Prop 57. Current eligibility, that takes us to number five, which is about mm -hmm. county. Well, no, I'm Sorry, yeah. on that one. <laughs> of course. So it's just a, I don't want to wordsmith the document. However, the um, opening in terms of your, the background and analysis gives Prop 57's analogy, but then jumps right into Ms. Schaefer's estimate of how many people might be affected without any, without any reference to, you know, in our consideration of this, we also saw and heard good, we saw data and heard research that many of these folks that are serving for violent offenses, uh, um, the data would indicate that after a certain number of years that they have, that they are more highly, or far less likely to commit, that they're some of the safest from a public safety point of view. So the only thing I'm trying to raise is that in terms of our background and analysis, that was a large factor. It was not just the number of people. And so I would like to have some reference of that fact up in that opening paragraph, rather than just the reference to the number of people it might affect. I think the reference to the number of people it might affect is, is material, but less, less guiding in terms of how we were viewing it. So I think Senator Skinner, there, there's a reference to that on page 24, the empirical research on um, people convicted of violent offenses and recidivism. It, it, so maybe that should be moved up uh, in terms yes. of the background section. Yes. I, yep. So I, I agree with, with both of everything that you said. And I should say that staff and I spent a, a good deal of time to try to figure out what should come first in terms mm -hmm. of um, priority. So, um, so I, I think that that's absolutely right. That um, and it and it resonates, of course, with our goal of um, you know public safety and equity at the same at the same token. Right. And I should mention another piece because um, it come in some ways combines parole and the reentry piece. Is another part of our reentry recommendation is that the parole board can recommend people go to go to an MCRP program. Um, rather than just to the streets. Right. Okay. Yeah, and I, I think for m me, part of why I wanted it um, to make sure that we <clears throat> emphasize the other first is that, and I said it, but while the number of people is material, it, I don't think it was the driving factor in terms of our discussion around why we thought it was a very legitimate and important recommendation. <clears throat> Absolutely. The, the the driving factor is that there's a large number of people who are safe to be released. Correct. And so that's why I want to make that up front. Right. So it's right. multiplying those two factors together gets us the, uh, the result. Right. Yes. Uh, I think we're up to number six, which we decided that we're going to push to the end. Right. And then after that is three strikes um, where we the recommendation is to repeal it. And there's three sort of interim steps uh, short of repeal. Um, about washout periods, juvenile adjudications, and limiting when a sentence is doubled because of a prior strike, limiting that to only new um, serious or violent convictions. And the final recommendation has to do with life without parole, creating um, two different review processes for life without parole sentences, one in court and one by the Board of Parole hearings. Just to clarify that, that, the one before court would after a certain amount of period of time, I forget what year, did we say 25 years, Tom? Yes. Um, to be able to go back to court and the court revisit the sentence. And the other is for the board of parole hearings to um, mandate them to make recommendations whether or not the governor should grant clemency to reduce their sentence from uh, life without parole, perhaps to life with parole or to, to release. But um, so those are two recommendations regarding uh, LWAP. Before we move on to number six, again, we'll come back, we're gonna to get to number six in a second. Um, 
are there any concerns, additions with, with the exception of what I think Senator Skinner brought up, which I wholeheartedly endorse and, and Professor Ochin, any thoughts, concerns, comments, edits about the remaining recommendations? Are we, are we still uh, on three strikes? I, I yes. Wasn't, okay. Uh, the only concern I have, and I don't know if you probably already voted on this, uh, I'm assuming that when you're talking about <laughs> a, a five year or more kind of washout period, uh, like the other washouts, it's free from custody, as opposed to someone being in and getting out the next day and committing another crime. The washout period assumes free from custody. Is that, do we deal with that? I, I don't think that's been explicitly addressed yeah. one way or the other, Justice Moreno, but I think typically that is how those periods are interpreted and, and, and understood for exactly the reasons you're, you're saying. Right. So the, it does then, you get into complicated issues about what counts as custody, but as a general issue, um, I right. think that's generally how they're interpreted. So is the report recommending the five or, or 10 or does it settle on something? It says five and that's consistent um, with the recommendation the committee made uh, in its 2020 report um, in the 1385 context to consider dismissing a sentencing enhancement if it relies on a conviction that's five or years older. And there's also a number of other states that have a similar washout period. Yeah. You know, they, they range in time, but uh, a few have five years. Yeah, well, uh, you know, I'm okay with that. I'd prefer 10, but if the commission is happy with a five year, then there's certainly a precedent uh, for that. So, I mean, if you've got someone who's been in prison, you know, for three armed robberies, I mean, I think a look back of 10 years is fine, but five is a bit short, but I'm not, I'm not offended by it. And, and I think for this to keep in mind too, is this is just about three strikes and there'll still be the nickel right. prior enhancement. So the, the scenario you're effects. talking about, right. I think there's still a hefty um, additional punishment available. Right, okay. Which is essentially doubling a robbery anyway. Yeah. Right. Um. I don't know what I recommend as a counter wording or alternative, but the the because total repeal may not be immediately possible. Um, I mean, I think we were discussing that it may not uh, it may be difficult because of the two thirds requirement. However, I don't know if we should word it as may not be immediately possible. So I'm not. Anyway, I just want to to flag that, and if I. Um, have some suggestion as before we are completed, I will happily um, bring it up. But I just think it's odd to word it um, may not be immediately possible because it's almost like we're already predicting that is and even though we know it's difficult. Yeah, I think that that's a good point. And we've tried, we wrestled with how to sequence these issues and we kind of put three strikes and the LWAP issue together because they would require a two thirds vote or a new so maybe some preface to those. We can umbrella those in a way that's, I think, a little bit more artful than, than we have. Okay. Um, as long as we put that sort of ping on it that uh, we may, um, the wording may be slightly revised, but still communicate the, yeah. Yeah. And that's, I think that's doable. I think we can, show not tell there as much as possible we can just say flat out what it would require rather than right. making any judgment about whether or not it will or won't happen okay any other comments concerns questions issues the the last thing i'd mentioned mike is um the report does conclude with uh, addressing two of the recommendations from last year, short prison stays and then the parole hearing process. Uh, the short prison stays, we're gonna have some additional data from our uh, partners at the California Policy Lab to get a little bit more into some of the causes for those short stays in prison. And just the headline is almost 40% of people go into CDCR, stay there for less than a year. So it's a huge number of people. Uh, and then the parole hearing process uh, portion of the report is similarly going to focus on just some new data that we have about um, parole hearings that a year of parole hearings conducted uh, in 2019, 2020, some of the information about a uh, number of people who had rules violations, RVRs as they're called, and 
things like that and dive a little bit deeper into that process just to say uh, that the committee's recommendation that the bottom line is the parole grant seems like it could be higher uh, without any real impacts to public safety given the very low recidivism rates of the people who are released and um, some of the characteristics of the people who are up for release. Yeah, just to put another point on that, these are recommendations from last year that were not even taken up as bills by the legislature from this year. So we're just kind of updating the information with new research um, and standing by our recommendations from, from last year. Yeah, I, I support that. And I think we might even word it um, something to the effect of not just that the committee, the words right now say something like, uh, uh, recommendations would help address these problems. We might just say the committee continues to stand, support these recommendations, something to that effect. So that there's still existing recommendations of the committees. Yeah, maybe we say existing recommendations. We'll have to wordsmith that a little bit as well. I, yeah. I agree with that. And, and again, with these type of wordsmithing issues, um, something that Tom and I, Laura and Rick will be working on in the next few weeks um, if any of you got, you know, we're really here wanting to vote substantively on any changes or questions, but some of the, the wording, of course, is important, but if you strike on anything that concerns you or have, have a great ideas, please, please, you know, call, email, text, we'll, we'll fix that. Okay, so just along, kind of along the lines of words, so thing, I know you just said- No, no, it's good, it's, as long as we're here. As long as we're here, okay. good, let's go. Uh, so I just wanna request if we can, so I'm looking at page uh, 34 of the report. We're still talking about three strikes, right? So um, there, I, I think there's a, there's, so there's a paragraph on page uh, 34 that, that's right under background and analysis that gives a number of people um, who are in prison serving a sentence lengthened by the three, three strikes law. But then on page 36, there's an additional data point that I think is really important, which is that a prior strike uh, for people who uh, were convicted of felonies that would not independently qualify um, as a strike. I think there's something uh, as a non-strike felony. Um, I think there's like 9,000 people, the report says. I think it would be helpful to put that near the or right to have that follow the initial number of 35,000 because I think it helps it to contextualize sort of the, the, the kind of offenses that people um, are receiving strikes for. I think it would also be helpful if we could get um, uh, in that footnote that follows that sentence that says there are 9,000 people serving a sentence for non-strike felonies um, that is lengthened by a prior strike conviction. It would be helpful to get sort of a, a maybe a list of the kinds of felonies that um, that uh, are counted in that 9,000, just, just as sort of additional context. Um, so that's my only recommendation um, on this section. I like that too. And just as a question, the point being to convey that it's it, in effect, it's 36,000 plus 9,000 who are in um, for terms that are uh, uh, far longer, well, it's not just base sentence, but it's... Uh... I, th I think that 35,000 includes the 9,000. Oh, it it's, it's a way oh, of slicing okay. and okay. saying a huge number of these are there for um, their current offenses is, is non-violent or non -serious. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah, and that's the way I read it. Okay. That's correct. I get it. And, and I think that that data, especially that Professor Ochin just mentioned, I don't know if that's easily gettable or put into a chart. I think that'd be awesome. Well, it, it's interesting because it's any felony um, is doubled and you have to go to prison if you have a prior strike. So the types of felonies that people are convicted of that 9,000, it's, it's, um, it's everything. Um, so we, we, we might be able to see what the most common ones are. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, right, agreed. Five most common ones are. I mean, let's see what jumps out. If it's easy to do, let's see what jumps out. Yeah. Okay. And it's going to be whatever the it it'll be what the most yes we'll, we'll figure something out. I don't think there'll be anything particularly um, 
novel there. I think it'll be what folks are otherwise convicted others have longer sentences, but we'll take a look. Did we discuss, sorry, I just have a, just a, a informational question. Did we hear uh, testimony about the geographic distribution of where these sentences are coming from? No, but that's some data that we are hoping to add to the report. The folks at CPL are, are have started to pull that for us. Okay. I think that that would be very important to add and not to just as a footnote, mm -hmm. but in the part where we indicate that we indicate that it's a racial disparity. I think there's some around age, but I think there's also because they're um, in terms of proportionate to per capita, there's a big geographic disparity. And if we're requesting data, um, are we able to determine if there are any gendered effects? So in terms of the women's population, what is the effect of three strikes, for example, for women serving uh, extreme sentences? I think that that I would like to know that it, whether it lands in the report or not, I, I wonder what that, that would look like. That, um... Yeah, I might be able to look at that. Of course, numbers are are very small compared to the to the male population. So um, we'll have to sort of see what conclusions uh, we, we can draw. I think the numbers are are I don't have them at hand, but they're they're much smaller, even I think proportionally. But I think it's a great point. I do think generally also the amount of scrutiny um, to the data that is done not just by this committee, but by you know. Uh, scholars and researchers at large with regard to the death penalty, all of those types of analyses could be provided to three strikes and LWAP sentences and you know, even more common crimes. And, and really, it's a shame that it's not. And I think one of the longer term uh, projects of this committee, of me, of mine at least, is to provide that type of level of scrutiny analysis to, to you know, all, all crimes, because it's not obviously the, just the death penalty where there are racial disparities and geographic disparities and those types of issues. Um, all right. I think we've hit on all of the issues except for number six, which is the appellate review of sentences. This is the one that we had um, essentially kicked down to, to this moment, which is whether or not we want to include a recommendation and this is to basically uh, copycat rule from New York State that allows judges, appellate judges, to reduce sentences in the interest of justice on appellate review. Um, we discussed that this would be a major sea change in the, the type of issues and the type of the posture of cases that appellate courts would uh, receive in California, as Justice Moreno, um, I think explained, and we don't need to go into great detail again, but of course, appellate courts right now merely look for legal error, constitutional error, but not to say that, um, or abuses of discretion, which is extraordinarily high, um, but, in, but does, and does not currently say, uh, you know, the sentence is, is too long, uh, even if a majority of the court believes that. Um, and this would be a, a major shift in, in attention and focus. It is currently practiced in New York State. And according to the data that we had, it looked like between f roughly 5%. Is that correct, Tom? I, I think it's been about 200 times in the last three years. So I'm not sure what proportion of overall appeals, but it's, it's used um, regularly, but not frequently, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, with that said, that number of cases um, in New York State, um, judges exercise their discretion, appellate judges, to reduce sentences based on the record. Of course, this is not asking for new sentencing evidence or argument. It's merely based on this record. Um, the sentence should be reduced in the interest of justice. Um, Justice Moreno, I don't mean, I'm sorry for summarizing your position and you think it that, but do you want to say anything more on this issue? Have you given it any additional thought? Is there anything to say on this? Uh, sure, yeah. And uh, Tom was uh, kind enough to send me a link to the discussion that was had on September uh, 30th, which uh, I think, you know, accurately 
and concisely kind of raise the points uh, that were points of concern for me, but I do have some additional comments. And I apologize for not being there. I was on, I think Tom knows I was in New Haven and given the time change and everything, I just couldn't uh, participate. Right, that's so, your second Yale reference. And <laughs> as an employee of Stanford University, I'm obligated I, to say something. So I go always, always. <laughs> you know. uh, but yeah, uh, but you know, I, I think that, I think Pete kind of said this in his comments. I, I don't think this is just a sea change, it's a tsunami. Uh, you're talking about something that's deeply ingrained in, in appellate review and deference to the, uh, the trial court who's there uh, in the first instance. So I think that would really rupture uh, that you know, ingrained uh, relationship. I have a couple of other points, but on, on the, in the guilty pleas, you know, I don't see, I think some of the states allow this kind of review even when there's a, a guilty plea with a proposed disposition. You know, a lot of the guilty pleas now, at least when I was on the bench, you had a, a waiver of any appellate rights, uh, except maybe uh, ineffective assistance of counsel. Uh, so that would have to be dealt with. So I'm, I'm fundamentally against uh, the non-deference to the trial court and the application of this uh, recommendation to, to guilty pleas. That really just sets a whole new ballgame. You know, more, more particularly, and, and this is something that Mike, Michael just said, I just don't know how an appellate court is going to be able to exercise its discretion without having a record. I mean, this, this is going to be an issue that would come up in, I don't know how many appeals. Uh, and ultimately, it, you know, whether or not a sentence is, you know, excessive or shocks the conscious or abuse of discretion. Uh, I think a, an appellate court, just in terms of the workload, even though this is gonna be more likely than not just resolved by a Wendy type brief, it's gonna be a throwaway issue. Nonetheless, the lawyers are gonna have to brief this thing. It's almost like a habeas corpus. They're gonna be arguing kind of the, 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 the equities really of, of the sentence and not, not legal error. So how are the appellate justices really going to analyze that? There is has to be a record for them to make a reasoned decision that a sentence is, is excessive. And I think it came up in the discussion on September 30th as to whether or not there's going to be some kind of proportionate analysis vis-a-vis -vis all other cases or just a comparative one for what other judges do, then you're really getting into a mess. I mean, I think this whole thing of comparative analysis with respect to Batson and jury issues is a mess for appellate judges. And to, and to create the same thing here, I think it's just gonna, uh, I don't know on what foothold uh, an appellate court would decide an issue like this just because they think that the sentence is, is excessive. So, I think that, you know, I think what also disturbs me is that, you know, New York is fine, uh, but we don't have to hew to what they do. Uh, I think we would need input, not only from the court, California appellate justices, you know, we've had cousins as a trial judge talk us about reentry and Klein talk to us about parole. I think we need input from the judges and from the judicial council, as well as from DAs and PDs and the criminal defense bar as to whether or not this is a good thing. So I think if we came out with something like this, they would, they would think that we were kind of off in left field. Uh, and I think, uh, well, the other thing, I think Nancy mentioned this was that the collateral consequences of coming with this kind of off the wall recommendation might do some harm to this commission's uh, credibility. And then finally, on getting back to the record uh, and this proportionate or comparative uh, analysis. It's much like the class action matter I settled this morning. When you look for commonality or similarity, how are you going to compare A to B to C to D? All defendants are different. All crimes are different. And to really let uh, have an appellate panel under three decide, well, this is too much. 
Now, I, I agree that there's some sentences in California, you know, like uh, consecutive life terms or 300 years. Yeah, I mean, that's crazy. Uh, but I think without some kind of error, and, and, and the suggestion is that the appellate courts will look for error even when there isn't any, when there's a, you know, kind of a, a crack in the sentencing scheme that they're gonna do something. But uh, I think to give them uh, kind of a blanket opportunity without legal error is gonna really increase their workload. They're gonna have to deal with a record and it's gonna be kind of create chaos and undo really a, a relationship between the trial courts and the appellate courts that it's 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 really going to disturb that relationship, and the trial courts are always the best to do it. You may think that uh, you know trial courts get it wrong, uh, but uh, I think to go this far is really a, a bridge too far. It is a tsunami, and this commission, you know, will be uh, criticized for what it's doing. And and I would say if if, if you don't agree with me. Uh, I, I would simply ask that the staff, you know, prepare a, a brief uh, footnote for me under that recommendation that Justice Moreno disagrees, blah, 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 for the reasons that I've said. But, you know, we are a body. Uh, and, you know, I think there's great honor in a dissent. I dissented quite a few times on major issues. But, you know, I, I would hope that uh, you would be persuaded by by my position on this, speaking as an, uh, you know, I've been in the trial court, I've been on the appellate court, never on the court of appeal, which is where all these are gonna end up. They're not gonna end up in the Supreme Court, I can tell you that. But it is kind of like a, a throwaway issue in my view. And, and finally, it's, it's too many, it's too few cases. We're talking about reform and reducing the jail population and everything. I, I, I told Tom, I didn't know where this issue came from. I guess I missed that meeting as well. Uh, but it caught me completely by surprise that we would be, have had this issue take purchase on our commission. When we're talking about penal code reform, but to go this far is just too far, at least from where I stand. So I'll submit the matter. Thank you, it's well argued. Um... We, have, we, we haven't discussed this particular question that I want to, just a point of reference and then I'll get to you, Professor Ochin. Um, first of all, uh, Justice Moreno, as I know that you were only, only on the Supreme Court, but you are the only appellate judge on this, on this committee and I deeply respect and defer to your judgment here. Um, we have not, as a committee, um, made any recommendation that was not unanimous but that does not mean that we don't have to. Right. And I would imagine that there would be times, perhaps now is one of them, where we would make a recommendation where it was not unanimous. Um, we're not voting on this right now, but it's my understanding, I just wanna make sure that I understand your position clear, um, is that at minimum, Justice Moreno, you think this deserves further study, hearing from appellate judges, perhaps folks from New York, and at least you would like to boot it to next year if not voted down altogether. No, and okay. to hear from people like Cousins or an appellate justice, not necessarily Anthony Klein, but <laughs> someone who, I was gonna ask, I was gonna ask Tani about it, but the workload. Sure, no, no, um, I get it. I just wanna understand your, your- And the record, I don't know what kind of record counsel would have to assemble and what the court, how it would deal with that, that issue, the appellate court. Understood, just Professor Ochin. I mean, it seemed to me that when we were discussing uh, this recommendation, it was also a part of a broader conversation about the role of appellate courts in uh, ensuring uh, equity, uh, uh, maybe equity is the wrong word, but some degree of consistency uh, with regard to criminal sentences across uh, jurisdictions, whether it's a county or the state. Um, and I think the response when I asked the question about this is that that's not a, 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 a role that appellate courts in California have traditionally played. Mm -hmm. That may be the case in the federal system or in places like New York. So this seems to me to be a wading into that broader policy question. Um, 
I do think that we should proceed with uh, this recommendation either now or next year, uh, because um, one, uh, issues related to sentencing disparities and the kind of sentence, sentences that judges impose, whether on individuals who have been convicted after uh, a trial or who plead guilty, um, cause a lot of uh, questions about the legitimacy and fairness of our criminal legal system. And I do think that appellate judges should be empowered uh, to modify a sentence in the interest of justice. Uh, and looking at the um, record from the state of New York, it isn't uh, as though um, appellate courts use this uh, discretion um, uh, widely. So I think the statistic that's quoted in the report is something like 200 uh, cases have sentences modified over a period of three years, where I imagine there are likely thousands that uh, were subject to review. Maybe this gets to the point that Justice Moreno was, was raising about um, the workload um, on the one hand in comparison to the number of sentences that are modified. But I think um, that having a second look uh, to ensure that issues related to race aren't shaping uh, how a defendant is being sentenced, uh, class, uh, other areas where we know implicit bias or explicit bias uh, may be playing a role, uh, I think would bolster public confidence um, in the judiciary. Uh, so I'm, I'm in support of this recommendation. I think we should proceed either uh, by setting this on the agenda and inviting conversation with um, uh, members of the bench to discuss this further, but I don't think that we should vote it down. I think we should either approve it or uh, set it for further consideration. Judge, th thank you. Uh, Judge Espinoza, I think that you had strong feelings about this, so I just was curious. Yeah, I, don't, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but I, I agree with Carlos that this is going to send shockwaves within the judicial culture, and I think I, I agree with the notion that if we are going to move in this direction, it might be um, better for not only the, the judiciary, but for this committee to spend some time receiving testimony um, from both appellate judges and trial judges on why this might be or might not be a good idea. I mean, I had, I, I, I think I spent more time expressing my uh, reservations about this in the previous hearing, but I think that's sort of an accurate summary of how I'm, I'm feeling about it. I'm not totally opposed to it, but I, I don't think we've, I don't think we we've, we've spent enough time on it to to go forward now. Senator Skinner, this process, if we were <clears throat> to approve it, would require so. I'm the incarcerated individual. I feel the sentence was too harsh. I would have to appeal, correct? This would this would create an appellant in appeal process. Is that right? But it would still require someone to appeal my circumstance. It, yes, it would be two two things. Um, many people appeal on numerous issues. Right. And this would be an additional issue on which they could appeal. Okay. So right so now, that circumstance number one. Right, right now, you can appeal only on legal questions. Correct. Correct. There was improper instruction from the judge. This evidence should have been in, included or not. There's some rule that was broken. You, so this would create a, a new claim that could be raised. My sentence is too long. Okay. So in addition, or too harsh. Yeah. Okay. In addition, people who had claimed no legal error. It would, and this that's the vast majority of cases, right? This is plea bargain cases, essentially. They would say, which is 90 plus percent of cases. I mean, like the vast, vast majority. Right. Would they be able to say, although there was no legal error in my case, no procedural issue, no evidence was seized unlawfully, my sentence is still too long. So that that's what it would be created. Um, so sorry, I interrupted. I just wanted to clarify that. No, it's okay. I um, so it's not just a matter of any court wanting to just look at relook at something. It has to go. It would be an appeal process. Um, um, I was struck by some of the comments 
that the Chief Justice had and in a little bit of our dialogue where she basically raised that, you know, the legislature is now making some big changes to not just now, but the voters and the legislature have made various changes to the penal code, some of which were explicit to be retroactive and some were silent. And she discussed how, you know, how that, how it has affected or how the courts pro, uh, approach it and such. And this is a little different than what is directly before us right now. It might be narrower, but I wonder if we would have a comfortability to have a recommendation that would allow for review of cases where the legislature has changed the law. So in other words, where to add some clarity then that rather than having to require the legislature to go back and relook at each of its statutes and make the that it changed and make them you know retroactive, rather that potentially allowing for a person who was uh, sentenced under a law that was then has now subsequently been changed mm -hmm. their ability to appeal. Justice Marino. Yeah, no, I think I think she explained that and. The problem is when the legislature doesn't expressly indicate a retroactivity, or where, as you put it, where the, the legislature says, hey, let the courts figure this out. Right. And that happens uh, a lot when you can't get agreement in, in the legislature. But for any kind of retroactivity, you have to be, has to be expressed that does apply retroactively. And I think they've done that uh, on occasion, and certainly where the current law has changed, that augurs well for, in a case that's ambiguous, mm -hmm. it's not retroactive, but hey, look, now the sentence is this. And there was a recent, I can't, there was a, a sexual molestation case where that was the issue a couple of years ago. Uh, so this does come up quite often. And I'm, I, I was not surprised, at least when, when she mentioned this retroactivity, I think I said, aha, that comes up quite a bit. And it would help to have the assistance of the legislature to be more, more express on that. Because it is, she's right, these cases linger. It happens in the civil context as well. Right. And it's another question. And, you know, they work on that again. And they go into the legislative history and all that, looking for little nuggets. Right. This applies retroactively. So um, what she described is that they tend, and again, she was, she can't, she couldn't uh, dictate to any particular judge, but that the tendency would be to, if, if it is not fully settled, if, they're, if it's still going yeah. through the process, right? So maybe the person has a conviction, but there's an appeal that there, there can be the weighing of this, of the change in law, even when it wasn't retroactive. So I raise it because I wonder if we would have a comfortability with a recommendation that would allow for appeals for those sentences that if, if they were to be sentenced today, that it might be different because of the change in the law. Yeah, yeah. I think this is a different, a different issue. Because okay. uh, we, we have the, re, we have the re look legislation that Cousins told us about. And so there is that in effect, I mean, someone could say, take a look at this sentence again after they've served what a minimum amount of time and one factor a trial judge would see, hey, well, now this thing is only punishable by three years, not 10 years. Uh, so why, kind of like ex post facto, you know, why let this person be, you know, be imprisoned under the old law when the laws changed, society norms have changed. You know, back in the day when I was a city prosecutor, uh, Peter probably remembers this, you know, loot, loot conduct, 647, what, little a or little, whatever, little b, whatever it was was a registrable offense. Well, to get that expunged, I mean, now I think there's some retroactivity there where that law changed. It's no longer a sex offender registrable offense. So I think, I think the law does take those things into account where someone's suffering punishment like registration uh, can be relieved of that because the law has changed. So. 
I think we're dealing with something else, something else here. Professor Ochin, did your, your hand is still up, so. Yes, yeah, I have a new, new question. So uh, my question is about, I guess it's a follow-up to Senator Skinner's question, which is, um, uh, Senator Skinner asked, you know, is this creating a new basis for appeal uh, when there is no legal error um, uh, that is being alleged? And in some ways, it seems to me like it, it is creating a new mechanism to allege a, a legal error of, of some kind, mm -hmm. right? So uh, uh, Judge Henderson, uh, I'm wondering if you can comment on this, but uh, in my experience, when I was a clerk for uh, a judge on the Sixth Circuit, we routinely got appeals regarding the reasonableness of a sentence, right? Uh, substantive reasonableness, procedural reason reasonableness, and the courts did have an opportunity to say this is, this is unreasonable because it's excessive and, and so forth. There were certain factors that um, uh, judges on an appeal could weigh in evaluating a sentence. Um, uh, and that was the basis of a, a, an appeal uh, asserting that there was a legal error because a sentence was unreasonable. And so I'm wondering, is this similar to that or is, is, is the proposal that this is different? Uh, so I, I'm just trying to get clarity about how we would frame um, this recommendation in comparison to other uh, jurisdictions, like for example, the, the federal system. Um, I, I didn't have much experience when I, when I sentenced, I, uh, you know, I always tried to be within the bounds of whatever the guidelines were. Uh, but, uh, let, let me go back to just giving my broad view. I, I came into this, uh, I, I, I thought the, the topic was interesting, a bit revolutionary, but I, I, I sort of liked it. I liked it, uh, perhaps for wrong reasons. I thought this will give the defendant and I, uh, uh, another shot at something. Uh, I, I liked it for that reason. And as a trial judge, I always uh, took great comfort in the fact that on some of the really serious things I was having to rule on, there was somebody up there looking that had more time than I did and then may, might take more time to look at it. And I was sort of, I came into this thinking that would be a good idea here to have a second look at it uh, because we trial judges, at least me trial judge, uh, you know, I think sometimes the, I miss the point. I've, I look back and I'm writing a bit about my 37 years of experience and I'm including things I regret that I wish I had another shot at that I somehow didn't do it the way I would now do it. So I came into it thinking this, but I'm also uh, very persuaded by Justice Marino's comments. And uh, I, I, I think we could learn an awful lot if we learn what the New York experience was. It, it, I would think it would answer a lot of concerns, one, or it would confirm a lot of concerns that Justice Marino has. But uh, I, I don't know, I, I think it's a, it's a good idea, basically, but uh, I think I would like to learn much more about the experience that New York and any other state that's tried this has had. I, I know I didn't answer your question, Professor Ochin, but. Yeah, uh, let me just say, I, I, you know, I was on the federal bench for, for three years and I, I don't remember that idea of, of the, uh, in the absence of error, uh, a, uh, a uh, appellate court, one of the circuit courts, you know, taking another look at the sentence again in the absence of error. But I just want to emphasize the case I haven't made myself clear on, on guilty pleas. And Peter can confirm this in, in, in most negotiated pleas as part of the, the, the uh, taking of the plea. The, it, it's, it's more done in state court, not so much in federal court. You know, you tell the defendant after taking all the tall waivers that you understand that the agreement here is, is that you're going to do three years in prison and says yes, yes, and then you proceed to impose 
uh, that sentence. If it's not something the judge is going to do, then you don't accept the plea. So I, I don't see how uh, someone who's entered a negotiated plea for a fixed term can later say too much time. You know, unless again, there's ineffective assistance counsel. He wasn't thoroughly advised about the amount of time. <clears throat> In an open plea, he, he gets more than he expected. You, you know, uh, again, if a proper waiver has been taken, uh, it's up to the judge, and he may think it's too much time. But with a carefully taken uh, plea, and I wrote an opinion on this, uh, what what recourse can he have if there is no no heir and he's been uh, fully advised? So I think the guilty plea part of this, its application, the guilty plea is really, uh, really problematic. Uh, so and if okay. you've ever seen a federal plea, how long does it take? It takes like 10 minutes, 15 minutes and you go through everything, the deal is sealed and and the sentence is imposed after a probation report. Some something changes, and yeah, the person can withdraw the plea. But it's it's I just see this as uh, yes, it's another arrow in the defendant's you know quiver of arrows. But in the absence of error, uh, I don't think the the trial court, and I've never heard of this is all new to me. That the uh, circuit court would say too much time. You know, no, no, I, I, I just don't want to just interject and reference what I was talking about. I was talking about the review of sentences post Booker. So for reason, right, there's, there's right. there. yeah, there's yeah, that's there. what I mean. That that is the legal ground. Oh, for, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you there. Then, if there's some kind of, you know, legal error on a factual, factual finding, uh, but uh, you know. We've, Peter and I have probably done tons of Marsden motions and in federal court, it's you know, substitute counsel. It's always too much time, mucho tiempo. Well, let you, me... have to, you have to advise this is what the deal is. And uh, so if a defendant has to be fully advised as to what the time is so for him later, absent, you know, habeas issue, ineffective assistance of counsel, it's, it's, it's a no, no go. So I, I'm in favor of putting this over, frankly. Uh, and maybe hearing from other states, but particularly from California uh, appellate judges and trial judges as to what the import or the impact of this kind of recommendation would be. I'm not, I'm all in favor of a second look generally, uh, but this, this is a dramatic, dramatic uh, change in what we have now. Let, let me take that opportunity to try to jump in here and try to mediate some solution yeah. as it were. Um, so first of all, Professor Ochin, I think that you're correct that post Booker, there is appellate review of reasonableness of sentences um, in the uh, directly rather absent some legal error. Um, I think it is much more discretionary, however, than my understanding of the way the New York rule works. So it's, it's usually goes not far, but in any event, it seems that there's consensus, at least among the judges who I take great deference from, and I'm going to join them <laughs> in saying um, that this needs further study. Um, that's set. And so um, I'm going to recommend that we put this over to next year with the following caveat, that with our report, we, are going, we, we already mentioned that there's going to be a section re-upping uh, recommendations from last year, which are particularly the short sentences and the uh, parole recommendations. Another bill that was not directly taken up like last year was the second look provision. And we could include a short section in that part of our recommendation for this year saying, we stand by our second look, particularly in cases where the law has changed and retroactivity may not be clear along the lines of the, what the chief justice was saying and what Senator Skinner was saying. Um, and and also disproportionate sentencing, like that would be another rationale for um, a second look, but not given this plenary appellate review or not recommend a plenary appellate review as we've been discussing, at least until we uh, address it next year. So again, my 
recommendation is, and I'd like to have a vote on this, is to A, postpone our consideration, postpone the recommendation on appellate review of sentence length. Number six. Number six. So does anybody object to, a, a, to hearing, and, and I don't mean to vote it down, I'm merely saying that we will hear it more from it next year. Anybody object to that? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, a majority of the, the committee has voted to postpone to next year consideration. I would also like to ask everyone if they are comfortable with adding a short portion, I guess, because we won't meet again, so we'll have to be in my discretion to add a short section to the report, re-upping our recommendation from last year on second look and saying that we think it's especially appropriate in circumstances of law changes and excessive sentencing. What do you mean by excessive sentences? Well, it, that we currently right? said in any circuit, our recommendation from last year was after 15 years, anybody could come back for any reason. Okay. Right. So where we'd say like, yes, we still stand by that, but we think it would be really especially appropriate if, if to review when a court decides that it's no longer in the interest of justice, which is basically the standard anyway. That's the standard. And whether that's excessive sentences or law changes or, dispar or disproportionate impact, that can, it's up to the judge to decide that. But we had said last year, for any yeah. reason, a judge could resentence somebody in the interest of justice. That was our recommendation from last year. So it's even a trial judge, a trial judge. A trial judge. Yeah. right, which would be subject to appellate review for abuse of discretion, right. So it'd be almost narrowing our recommendation or just saying that we think that these circumstances are particularly important. Do people, can I get a vote? Is anybody opposed to that? addition to the report. Senator Skinner. I, I don't know if we need the addition of saying especially in excessive since yeah. we already have, it allows for it without, because of the way it's written last year, I, I think we might be wiser just to pull it from last year as we have the two other, we have two other items in this report from last year and we just take it and Put it back and we can have some a little verbiage as to you know why we've why we are re-emphasizing it but i don't think we need to to um specify to further iterate yeah well do you want to mention the portion about law change changes in law yeah i think that's i think that's legitimate yes okay and i think it was again i'm not going to say i have such a brilliant memory that you know, we may not have discussed it explicitly, but it w it was in the context of that there's um, there has been a whole relook at at uh, there's at uh, sentencing at uh, you know societal norms. Voters have acted. You know that was part of our whole discussion. We weren't again explicit about. Um, necessarily that the legislature may have passed some things where they were silent, but I think given that it was raised to us today, that that is an issue, then it is worth it to reference it. I, I think that that's right. And, I, and if, if memory serves, uh, Secretary Allison, when she addressed this committee, she talked about her sentencing uh, or recommending resentences in law change cases or we know that a large portion of the cases that CDCR has sent back under 1170D for recommendation for resentencing have been on the basis of law change. Right. So I think that that makes sense too in light of earlier testimony this year. Okay, so there's agreement amongst the committee that we will add a short section to the portion, to the port of the portion of the report where we're re-upping recommendations from last year on um, the um, second look resentencing provision. Okay. All right, good. And agreement among the committee that we will revisit appellate review of length of sentence next year, hearing from California appellate judges, trial judges, New York experience, and I think Professor Ochin, the federal bench as well, we should examine that issue a bit too. And because I it probably was a big change for them, even if the standard of review was quite deferential, but 
that would be interesting to hear. Um, all right. With all that said, um, we cannot vote on whether or not to adopt the report until we have public comment. So unless anybody objects, I'd like to move to the portion of public comment. Are we ready? All right. We've now reached a time for public comment. Today's public comment is limited to comments on the draft report, which was published and distributed last week. To get in line to comment, please select the raise hand function in Zoom. If you're calling in, hit star nine. Please note that the meeting is being recorded. And if you make a public comment, your name or phone number may be displayed as part of the recording. If you'd like to comment, please select raise hand or dial nine on your phone now. I'll take a minute to see how many people want to comment. And based on that, we'll see how long each person has to comment. Please know that the committee also accepts public comment in writing. In fact, that is the preferred way and the more substantive way that you can get comments to us. And that com those comments can be emailed to committee staff whose emails are on the committee webpage. As a reminder, we'll be voting on the community report after hearing public comment in case issues arise that may influence our decisions. Um, so that said, uh, please select your raise hand function. I'll give people another minute or two to raise their hands and then we'll go in order. All right, it looks like we have five uh, commenters. Um, if you could each take uh, a minute and a half, I'd appreciate it. Tom, can you uh, go down the list for us? <clears throat> Let's do it. First up is Michelle Funez Artiega. Hello, thank you. Uh, I am commenting on the recommendation to strengthen the mental health diversion law. Um, I work in this field. I'm here commenting just on my own behalf. Um, but being, being sort of boots on the ground on this, um, it feels like mental health diversion was created without any additional resources. Um, and working directly with the courts, I'm a social worker working directly with the courts and, and um, community providers on mental health diversion, the thought of it being expanded so broadly without any additional resources is frankly overwhelming. And um, I specifically attended to say that I don't know if this committee is considering things like resources. They are not limitless. Um, we are working very hard to try to get people services when there was a nexus between the mental illness and the charged offense. But to open it up to there being no necessity for a nexus, only that the person has a diagnosis in the DSM, which again is very broad, um, excluding the, the excluded diagnoses, um, is something that I don't know if this committee's thought about. This is my first time attending. Unfortunately, I was had to deal with something when you discussed this topic earlier, which I've and sitting here listening for a long time, so I'll listen to the recording. Um, but I just wanted to say that I don't I don't know um, if if that's of any value or not. But thank you. No, that's quite valuable. Thank you. Um, of course, we recognize that this is a big chicken and egg problem. Um, unfortunately, this committee has no um, influence really over the purse strings. That's somebody else's problem. Um, including one of our members. Um, but um, uh, I, I, do, I do appreciate it. We know that that, that that is an issue. Of course, there's, we've, our recommendation allows for judges to override the presumption. So it's, it's not quite automatic, but, but I appreciate the concern and, and we realize it's a significant one. Um, Crispy? Crispy. Hello, my name is Crispy. I'm a survivor of harm. Thank you, committee and staff for all your hard work and dedication and for these recommendations. Um, for recommendation number eight, please return it to abolish life without the possibility of parole sentence. Abolishing the death penalty must go hand in hand with the abolition of this draconian sentence of life without the possibility of parole. Also, I would like to see you promote the parole hearing process in the analysis section to a recommendation. The parole grant of 16 to 22% is deplorable. 
all the work we do to change the penal code around resentencing will be wasted if this bottleneck is not removed. All the changes to the penal code must be retroactive. Also, I want to point out 242 incarcerated people have died of COVID and outbreaks continue. There is an outbreak at Central California Women's Facility where only 65% of staff are vaccinated, which is 13% lower than the re resident vaccination rate of 78%. Three judges, Klein and Von Stage, Tiger and Plata versus Newsom and Howard in the San Quentin habeas case have said that CDCR has violated the Eighth Amendment, which prohibits the cruel and unusual punishments of incarcerated people, yet CDCR's budget is $17.2 billion dollars, which 13 and a half goes to staff who have continued to fight the federal receiver's mandate to vaccinate in Plata versus Newsom. Although the prison population has dropped and two prisons are soft closing because DVI has closed before and now it's closing again, the cost of CDCR has gone up. This is not a just system and we need to do better. Thank you very much. Thank you, Crispy. I don't think we uh, our, our, our recommendations from last year are not any weaker than they, than they were this year. And I think that we will continue to push for them. So, um, but of course, if, you know, I, we also appreciate your regular participation and commitment to, to LWAP sentences, which I think we're gonna chip away at. Thank you. Next up is Fair Chance Project. I think you're on mute. Whoever's from the Fair Chance Project, I think you're on mute. So sorry. Oh, oh it's Jerry. I've wasted a whole minute. No, um, Jerry, we'll, we'll give you the full time. Yeah. Um, well, in regards to life without parole, I have to weigh in with Crispy. Um, because these are just recommendations, I think it's very important to um, be strong about your recommendation of life without the possibility of parole, as it is just another death penalty. You've taken a strong position on death by injection. This is death by incarceration. Your recommendations, I applaud them. I, I just, I feel like they need to be, if the legislature takes these up, you know, which I hope they do, they all need to find a way to make, implement these so that they're not just um, based on the whim of the sentencing court or the parole board. There has to be some real hope for somebody serving LWAP. And with the parole, going on to the parole, with their, their findings, um, are, are horrible, as Crispy pointed out. There is um, a man in Pelican Bay State Prison that wanted to write for uh, Dr. Professor Ocean because she commented about parole and why are their findings, you know, why are so many people denied? And he said it lies with the um, psych reports. And he has written up a whole paper, which I would love to get to this committee. He doesn't want to just mail it out straight to me because he's afraid it'll be interfered with. So I would like to have an address where he can mail it because his findings are firsthand and I think they're excellent. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, thank you, Jerry. Um, we, can, we can get you an address. You should email Tom from the committee and he'll get you a hard copy address where he can um, send any comment to us. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Marion Wickard is next. Hi, everybody. I always get so nervous when I talk to you. Marion Wickard here supporting my husband, Tommy Wickard. I'd like to discuss number six, appellate review. Tommy is guilty of his crime. Therefore, he, he accepted the plea bargain offered of 57 years. If he had went to trial and was found guilty, he would have received 25 to life. Tommy would have already been afforded the ability to to attend BPH and highly possible he would be out of custody. I believe all defendants should be awarded the opportunity to have an avenue to say, hey, my sentence is excessive. We shop, then we decide we don't like the item, we return it to the store. Sure, he heard the tall waivers, but did he really understand? This is a life-changing shopping spree. 
Defendant should be able to return it to the store. Yet as a defendant, Tommy was told, as many defendants are, it's buyer's remorse. You made the deal, you have to keep it. I support number six, the appellate review. Please support it as well. Please support number six. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you, Ms. Wickard. Um, we really do appreciate your comments and you shouldn't be nervous at all. I, let me just say that I think that the second look recommendation from last year, um, I think would be more applicable to your husband's situation, at least from what you've described and, and actually more applicable to, to, to more people. So I think at least this, the resolution that we've described today were to be enacted um, would effectively address some of your concerns. And we will, as promised, uh, look more into the appellate review of sentence lengths next year. Thank you very much. Thank you. Irma Cooper is next. Hello, my name is Irma Cooper, and I'm calling on the behalf of my son, Julius Whiten, at Sentinella State Prison. I want to thank you for considering uh, to get rid of the three strikes, because it is a death sentence, um, and I appreciate the washout period, because when you go back 20 years um, on a case and the person has already served the time, I truly feel is, is double jeopardy in those cases that they have to be penalized again. Um, and as you know, a lot of these people with these three strike sentence were nonviolent cases and they're getting more time in prison than someone who has killed multiple people at a time. Uh, and then the issue of health care, as they have these long sentences, health care and dental care is basically non-existent. And especially with the COVID now, I haven't been able to see my son in over two years because they frequently have uh, COVID outbreaks at Sentinella State Prison. And the guards um, are not mandated to get any shots or anything. So that risk is constantly there uh, for my loved one. Uh, so really, I just want to thank you uh, for dealing with the three strike issue. Uh, because a lot of family members, including myself, we are totally separated from our families. And as you know, most of these prisons are so many miles away from home that we can't even afford to go visit as often as we would like. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Cooper. Um, if you followed us at all, I think that you saw how swiftly the, that uh, recommendation came through this committee that we pretty uh, all strongly feel um, that it should be abolished. And I know that it's especially hard over the holidays for you and your loved ones. It's difficult to visit. So um, good luck to you and thanks for, thanks for attending. Jane Courant. Good afternoon, uh, committee. Uh, Jane Courant here, another uh, groupie. Uh, I appreciate all your work. Uh, I don't mean to make light of these very serious undertaking and uh, appreciate all your thoughtful comments. Um, in light of the fact that um, uh, AB 256, as you may be aware, is, which is to make the Racial Justice Act for all retroactive, um, I was especially interested in the Chief Justice's remarks about retroactivity. Um, to, to strengthen the push to get this passed, because it is going to take two thirds, I want to urge you to highlight in your report, in every way you can, on every point that you can make, the racial disparities in our sentencing. And this is particularly relevant to um, your recommendations seven and eight. You can't put this more front and center. Um, because this is something that is going to be out there as we lobby mm -hmm. to get this passed. Uh, I also want to appreciate Senator Skinner's wordsmithing of the intro to, I believe it was, it's recommendation seven on three strikes. That really has to be more specific, and it should not be pessimistic. It should not indicate we're going to lose before we began. 
Um, as one of the previous speakers, uh, Jerry Silva mentioned, people sentenced to three strikes or LWOP um, lose hope. And unless they can be given some reasonable hope that there is a committee out there that's taking their lives seriously. Um, as Crispy said, and as Jerry emphasized, the death penalty and, and LWOP need to be looked at together. LWOP is a living sentence of death by incarceration. So uh, please, please strengthen these portions to the degree that you can. Um, I appreciate Professor Ocean on this committee um, and, and her comments and her responses are always ones that I listen to carefully because I do feel um, with all due respect that, you know, that, that this, is, this is a very white committee and, and uh, we need to, excuse me, Doug, how can I overlook Honorable <laughs> Doug Dalton Henderson? I'm, I'm thrilled that he, with his background, is on this committee too. So please highlight, highlight these disparities. Don't uh, avoid doing it every, in every place you can in this report. These are recommendations. They're read, I hope, by the Senate and the Assembly members, and they have had an influence, as we have seen over the past two years. Thank, so thank, thank you, Miss. Thank you, Miss Grant. So, first of all, um, I, you know, I, I, I don't want to get into, you know, ca counting the skin color of the people on this committee, but let me just say that it is absolute priority, I think, of all of us to address the issue of racial inequality and justice system. It was the very first thing we heard from Governor Newsom when he um, established this committee, when he appointed uh, those of us to the committee and testified before us. We, and we, uh, in all of our reports, I think, address it, whether it's um, driving on a suspended license all the way up to the death penalty. So we really do appreciate that. Um, and we also appreciate, you know, that you're a groupie. So thank you for, again, and, um, We'll see you next year, I'm sure. And I'll also just add that we do have, I do wanna, I don't think it's counting the skin color. I think it's noting the perspectives of the members of this committee. We have two Latinx judges, uh, and a, a American uh, legislator and, you know, Latin, Latinx communities are just as impacted uh, in terms of disproportionate disproportionality as our uh, black communities. So I just wanna make sure to, you know, lift that up. Thank you. I, I did overlook that in my comment as I was saying it. So thank you very much. Um, and I appreciate the diversity here today. Thanks. Next up is Yolanda N. Hi there. Um, I just want to come on here and say thank you very much for everything that you're doing. I too am a crime survivor. And I wanna reiterate everything Crispy said, we need to abolish LWAP. You know, the district attorneys don't have any oversight. The judge's hands are tied. You know, are they being held accountable for giving an innocent person LWAP when they clearly gave the opportunity to the perpetrator for a 25 to life? And I'm just gonna leave it at that. Thank you again for your time. Thank you, Yolanda. I know that you're also a longtime listener and commenter. We appreciate it. We, we especially appreciate the voices of, of crime survivors and that you have perspective of folks on the inside. So thank you for coming and advocating for them as well. Next up is Joanne Shear. Uh, hello, committee. Again, um, it's, it's really good to see you and thank you so much for your work. Uh, I'm going to to keep it short and sweet. Um, I was disheartened to find that this committee is not recommending the abolishment of life without the possibility of parole as you did the death penalty. Um, again, I, I stand with the others who are calling in about this and, um, and I am also very nervous in front of all of you. <laughs> um, I, 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 wanna, I wanna put this in perspective if I could please. Um, my only child had never been in trouble. And he was a 
a very, very uh, loving and giving member of his community before one moment in time changed his life. And he will now never leave a prison cell and I will never see him free again because of a district attorney's decision to charge a special circumstance when they don't have to. It's completely uh, up to them and it's completely arbitrary. Um, we have got 5,200 people serving life, a death in prison. And uh, I have to answer to my son when he was 20 years old and said, mom, why, why are they giving me life in prison without parole? I didn't have an answer to that. I still don't have an answer to that. And, but we do stand by and we watch people come before the parole board who, uh, who uh, we think everybody should come before the parole board, but uh, there are people being given the opportunity to come before the parole board and, and my son and many, all of those 5,200 people who are serving, serving death in prison will never be able to do that. And they should all be given the opportunity. My son was a great kid before that moment in time and he's a great person now. Um, but he'll never be able to prove that to anybody. And I, I, I just please ask for your recommendation to abolish this sentence because it is a death sentence and it's a death sentence for the, for the family and for the community as well. So thank you very much uh, for your time. I appreciate all of you so very much. Thank you, Ms. Shear. Um... Let me just say with regard to a recommendation um, on life without parole, um, that I think that we all believe in hope and redemption and the possibility for change. And as a practical matter, I believe that our recommendation will achieve um, the goals that, that you're espousing um, here if they are adopted uh, by the legislature or, or the voters. Um, and perhaps more effectively than going before the parole board. Uh, in any event, um, thank you for your comment. I know that you're also a long time um, caller or listener and caller or groupie. And um, again, then I'm sure it's especially difficult over the holidays when you have loved ones behind bars. Because um, I don't see any additional hands up. I think we've come to the end of public comment. And we're now at the final point of our deliberations on the 2021 annual report. I'm not going to ask to rehash each of the recommendations at this time, but instead ask if there are any additions or modifications that committee members would like to make to the report at this time. All right, uh, can I have a motion and a second to adopt the report subject to our discussion earlier, including the prerogative that I have as chair to make non-substantive changes, approve design, and execute its publication. So moved. Second. Thank you. Uh, any opposed? All in favor? Aye. Aye. So I could, everybody unanimously approve the recommendations? I'm, very happy for that again that we move forward unanimously again that we don't have to in the future but um, I'm proud that we've reached consensus on these recommendations. Let me just um, this is our final uh, committee hearing of the calendar year and let me I just wanted to make a few closing remarks. First of all thank you to to, to you all. We've, I think we've accomplished a lot today and this year in general. I'm very proud of what we accomplished in the legislature and the governor over this past year and I hope that our recommendations in this report have similar success. Staff and I remain in regular contact with the governor's office and key legislators, and we will of course keep you updated on our progress. Tomorrow, I should also note, is a big day for the committee as we plan to release a report on the death penalty. A draft has been on our website since June, but we have added more material and data to the final version, and we'll make sure that everyone on the committee receives a copy and the public will be able to access our report on the website um, at some point tomorrow. We plan to release the annual report that we just approved now um, before the end of the year, ideally before the holidays. After that, we'll reconvene early next year to discuss our agenda for 2022. 
who spent a lot of time discussing problems with our criminal system and what doesn't work. I hope to spend a good portion of next year focusing on what does work and how we can lift up, support, and enhance programs and statutes where data shows significant improvements to public safety. And I'll reach out, of course, to each of you individually in the next few weeks and hope that you can think about topics that you would like the committee to take up next year, including, of course, appellate review of excessive sentences. We will be in touch with scheduling for our initial meeting, but uh, I hope to have our initial meeting of 2022 in the middle to end of January. Finally, let me close this last public meeting of 2021 by thanking my fellow committee members for your time, your insights, your expertise, your friendship, your input, all everything. I'm, it's really an honor to work with you. I also, of course, want to thank members of the public who call and write into us, especially our groupies. Your input is heard and it's very much appreciated. And lastly, uh, thank you to our truly amazing staff, Rick and Laura, our consultants, Natasha and Dan, Commission Attorneys Brian and Barbara, and last, of course, but not least, um, our committee director, uh, legal director, Tom. You've all gone above and beyond building a foundation for this committee since its inception just uh, a little while ago and helping to develop and hone a wave of vital reports and recommendations that are now law, which we should all be proud of. You've also researched new ideas, found experts to appear before us, draft reports, and making sure this committee and California generally has the best and most current information, data, and research available. Your work is really outstanding. It makes us look good. It makes me look good. It deepens our understanding of complex issue, and I believe improves the quality of justice in our, in our state. So thank you. Thank you all. I hope you all have a very good holiday. I'm sure I'll be in touch with you. Please be in touch with me if you have any additional questions, issues, or concerns. Um, and with that, uh, this meeting on the Committee of the Revision of the Penal Clo Code is now uh, over. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Happy, happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Happy holidays. Same to all of you. Okay, thanks.